for in our Sunday school lesson on this uh, evening. Amen. So can we first bow our heads as we go into a word of prayer? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the lessons that we are learning and its perspective on what is true and necessary. Deliver us from the worldly mindset that repeatedly tries to take our thoughts captive. May we be alert to spiritual mindfolds that we willingly put on so readily and easily this week. Provide us with opportunities to help remove the veil from someone else's heart. We pray as your servants in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that the words that we share on this evening might find even ourselves in the word of God, looking and striving, God, to be better in you, building ourselves on your most holy faith, God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So once again, good evening and praise God for our leadership, Bishop. Robinson and Pastor Boone and all of our uh, leadership evangelist Donna Woodland, who is over our Sunday school. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We want to take this opportunity to say thank you for allowing us this opportunity to share the word of God. So we're going to get right into it. I don't mess around in the beginning because there's so much in this book. I said, Donna, you gave me the hardest chapters. But anyway. <laughs> Oh, right about now, I feel like sitting at Elder Matthew's feet about all of this stuff and Pastor Booms. But we're going to get right into the fact that um, y'all thought I was going to forget. Y'all had homework this week. <laughs> I had homework. You had homework too. So let's talk about our homework from last week. Last week, we talked once again, the subject matter is the hope in the Lord. And last week, we talked about uh, Paul's labor and... Um, what Paul did in regards and how he suffered many things for the body of Christ. And we talked about adulting. We talked about growing up and um, sometimes it's hard to grow up in some things, but it's always good to grow up. But we did have a homework assignment and let me get to, uh, all right, I have it right here because I have it highlighted. So your homework assignment was found on page 347. And I'm asking somebody if they had an opportunity to go over their homework assignment, if they'll uh, raise their hand so Brian or who's ever in charge can unmute them. And if the homework assignment says, what factors affect how you counsel someone who has experienced ongoing suffering? And they said to keep in mind, Joe 42, one through eight. I, I'm assuming that everyone understood the question because no one texted me and asked for further explanation about the homework assignment. You know how we do that all the time. Teacher, teacher, I didn't quite understand. So could you help me with the question? So I see uh, the first person on my, um, I see Sister Tracy. Tracy, does that mean you need to be unmiked? All right, who's ever doing the miking? Um, could you unmic? I see Sister Vivian, she's got her paper ready. So we're going to ask Sister Vivian, Sister Tracy. So we're going to ask, uh, Tracy, are you there? Does that mean a yes or no? Okay, well, we got Sister Vivian. We're going to go first. first. All right. Okay. Um, the factors, um, they said keep Job 42 in mind, and that has to do with um, his friends that were um, trying to counsel him and... Um, what I got from um, the factors as far as me counseling was that number one, you have to speak. The Lord told told them to speak the thing that is right. So that's number one. And the other thing is don't counsel without knowledge. So that was the the um, the other factor that I um, that I experienced as far as reading those those scriptures and also with our lesson. Love it. Don't counsel without knowledge. Sometimes we get out there and we think everybody that's going through is going through the same thing we're going through, but don't counsel without knowledge. Excellent. Love that. All right, Sister Tracy, you're on. Praise the Lord, Sister Flo. Praise the Lord. Um, I didn't have my, I didn't have the book, but um, I was just reading and, um, what I got from it is um, that we must realize that suffering is a part of all of our uh, the believers' lives, 
And, um, you know, you don't want a person to think, oh, I'm suffering or I'm going through something just because I've sinned or, you know, I'm, I'm doing wrong. And it could be, but that's not the way we um, present our, our um, being compassionate. We have to be compassionate to them when we're counseling them. And um, also, like Vivian said, we have to speak truth and we also have to be non judgmental in our wow. presentation and um, just be compassionate and sympathetic. Amen. That's I wasn't awesome. really. No, you did a wonderful job. Don't even, mm -mm. no takes backs. <laughs> no take backs. I'll take one more. Is there someone else? One more. Do I see your hand? Don't make me call on you. I'm going to play past Pastor Matthews. I'm going to play like him. Do I see another hand? Somebody wants to be on mic. Let me see who's out there. All right. Since I see nobody put a hand up to be on mic, we're going to move on. But thank you. That's exactly what it, it deals with. It deals with us counsel, counseling from Paul was trying to stress that, you know, one of the things that we have to do um, is remember that we, well, in dealing with it with Job, like Evangelist uh, White shared, make sure you don't counsel without knowledge, you know, just don't run in there. And a lot of times we do, and there's nothing, the word of God is going to do what the word of God is going to do. But we have to understand that every scripture is not going to apply to everyone. I heard a story a long time ago that the person said that they were going to open up the word of God and they were just going to put their finger on the scripture and whatever the scripture said, they were going to do it. And they opened up the Bible and the Bible fell on that um, Judas hung himself. And they were like, oh, no. <laughs> they were like, so then they said, oh, I'm going to try to do it again. And so they opened up their Bible and they put their hand on the next scripture. And the next scripture said, and whatsoever you do, do it quickly. So we have to remember, beloved, that, you know, in application and one of the things that we have to do when we minister, we are servants. And when we're out here, we have to be, Sister Tracy said, that suffering is a part of the believer's life, you know, but we have to be compassionate. And I've heard somebody say, well, listen, we all going through, you going to go through, I'm going to go through. Well, that don't help you when you're going through. You need someone that's going to be compassionate and be non-judgmental. So I, I praise God for that. That was truly a blessing. And thank you. If anybody remember their homework later, they can buzz in and I will definitely put them in. So thank you for that. So this chapter today, we're moving in and we're talking about being bold ministers. And we do understand that every time the scripture talks about being a bold minister, yes, it does. It does. The scripture is directly talking about those who minister the gospel, those who are shepherds and those that are pastors. But the application is, is that as we minister as servants, as we're there, these teachings are to help us as servants and as men and women of God. We don't always get it perfect. We don't always say that, well, I was waiting for you to say something because I didn't know. No, this is teaching us that we are to minister from our hope from what we have learned about the things in the uh, word of God. So we're going to jump right in. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I like being, you know, transparent. I had to read this scripture <laughs> four and five times. I don't know. But was, you know, it's funny. Uh, when you read some of our famous authors and stuff like that, you said you had to, you know, find the plot. You had to read it, you know, um, over and over to try to find, you know, the plots of the stories as you're reading these books. Well, believer, beloved, I had to read this thing over and over again. So I'm hoping and praying that I got right to where I needed to be to expound on it this afternoon. So I'm going to read the fifth verse, and then I'm going to jump down to the 14th verse, because the more you read it, the more it gets confusing if you haven't read it through the first time. So I'm just going to read Second Corinthians, the third chapter, and the fifth to the 18th verse. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. In other words, Paul saying, don't think of yourself so suchy much. You know, um, I forgot how my mother described it, but it's thinking yourself above yourself. And so Paul was saying, but our sufficiency is of God. We must recognize that whatever we do, however we do, it is it comes from God. 
but we do, and Paul goes on later to talk about, but we do have a place in it. Don't think, oh, oh, it's going to come from God. No, you got to put the work in. It's going to come from God, but make yourself available. So he goes on in the sixth verse. So let me read the sixth verse also. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And we'll go on to talk about the letter that he's talking about here. Somebody can put in the chat. What letter do you think that Paul is talking about here? But he says, but the spirit giveth life. Can you say amen? The spirit giveth life. So it goes on in the 14th verse where I said I was going to pick up the law. Thank you, evangelist. So he's talking about the law. He's talking about that the letter, the spirit of the letter killeth. No one could keep the law, but it, it brought us unto condemnation. And it was the law of Moses. But on the 14th verse, it said, but their minds were blinded for until this day, they were minded. They remain the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away with Christ. Now I'm going to break down those other chapters, scriptures. I just didn't want to read them. He said, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. In other words, Jesus Christ is here and they are still not believing. They're still holding on to the letter of the law. Um, it goes on to say, now the Lord is the, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The veil was taken away by the, uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made. And it goes on to say that now the Lord is that spirit. That's Paul is saying here, listen, this is the spirit I'm trying to talk to y'all about. He's saying, now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Let me just put a pin right there for a moment. What Paul is saying, there is liberty now. You don't have to be bound to the law. Beloved, that does not mean that in Christ and in holiness, we get out here and do what we want. Because you know, I, I, I'm i free and I can come back and say, Jesus, forget. no, we try to live a life unto holiness. Paul was not saying we get out here shucking and jiving and doing whatever we want because now we're covered. That's not what Paul was saying. He was saying you are not bound to the law, but there is freedom. You don't have to bring the sacrifices anymore. You don't have to bring the sheep and the goat. I really would have been messed up because y'all, I don't like blood. And they talking about you got to cut a pigeon, do this and do that. No, it was just been all over me. It was a wrap. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. But he was saying that you don't have to do those things no more. More, but you walk in the liberty where Christ has set you free. But we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Paul goes on and the writer goes on here as we are reading throughout our lesson they open it up with that glory stuff. And I love the little story with the little boy, everybody in church is saying, I want the glory. God, give me the glory, glory to God. He running around trying to find out where that pile of glory is. But such as a childhood thinking eventually was replaced with adult thinking. A lot of times when you talk about 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, we run around trying to think, what is the glory of God? Where is the glory of God? But a certain element is question, how does the concept of glory come into play as we live before God, as we will live before God in a falling world? This is how Paul gets to this answer. And this is what the text writer is writing on this afternoon. He goes on to tell you about the lesson context. And I think that's really good because the word of God does apply to us. And some of the same things that we're seeing in the scripture is going on nowadays. He goes on to talk about how Paul was writing in the book of Corinthians. And they said that this was Paul's, these letters of Paul's was one of the hardest and most difficult among all of Paul's 13 epistles. And beloved, I believe it. Because even this one chapter was a bit rough to read. But it goes on to say that the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians show a congregation on several fronts. Paul's 
apostolic authority was being aggravated by those troubles. His letters to the future, um, to, to feature responses shows where he was having concerns. Paul used much, much ink, they say, in the second Corinthians to defend the legitimacy of his apostle calling. And you know, when I came out of reading this, I'm going to be honest, it encouraged me to be reminded all the time to pray for the men and women of the gospel, to pray for our leaders, because they're always being challenged. Well, what makes you think that's right? Well, who are you? You know, they're always being argument and they've got to still stand up and defend their desire to want to teach and preach the word of God. And not only that, to share the word of God. So Paul was being faced with that. And he had a problem doing the Corinthians. And I'm telling you, in these days and times, we have a problem too. You have to be very careful what you say, because anybody can Google in a minute. So I always say that it's always open to the bishop and our leadership. For, uh, Pastor Boone, you know, if something happens and they want to address it, you know, on next week, I'm fine with that because I don't know it all. Or Pastor Larry, when a church I used to go to years ago, he after he got finished preaching, the pastor would stand up and say, open up your text, and he would read divide the word of God. Thank God for grace among our leadership. They, they'll catch me next week. But anyway, so Paul had to fight. Corinthians was about Paul trying to share with them and but most of his chapters of him just trying to share about how we're free from bondage and what the glory of God is, he had to fight through those chapters, trying to defend who he was in the gospel. Let's pray for our men and women today that they'll have the freedom to preach and just share the open word of God and that the hearts will be receptive and that our ears will be open. Can you say amen? I know you can because I can't hear you, but anyway, praise God. So in the first verse, Paul talks about his expertise. He talks about the fact, thank you, Sister Anna, uh, Evangelist Anna. He talks about the fact in the fifth verse, he talks about that we are not sufficient of ourselves. We are not to think that we have it all together and it's all about us. But Paul goes on to say later on, he says, he makes it clear, although he has confidence in the results of his ministry, it is God who gets the credit. It is God who gets the representation. Any sufficiency is from God. Anything that I do is from God. The credit all goes to God. But he also acknowledges we still have a part in it. We still have to present ourselves. He goes, the writer goes on to say, what do you think? If God makes us sufficient for the work he desires of us, what responsibilities are we left with as a result? Believer, we have a responsibility. We have a, can somebody tell me in the chat, what's one of our responsibilities? Even if the sufficiency is of God, what's one of, y'all see, I like to ask a lot of questions, but what is our responsibility? That's not going to be your homework for this week, but drop it in the chat. If God makes us sufficient for the work he desires of us, what responsibilities are we left with as a result? Amen. But Paul goes on, I mean, the writer goes on in the sixth verse and he says, who also make us able-bodied ministers. He wants us to know that the, yes. Thank you, Pastor uh, uh, Evangelist Donna, to study, to pray and seek the will of God. That is our responsibility. Yes. God is able to do the work, but he wants us to present ourselves, to pray, to study. Bishop said in his sermon, uh, he talked about how the child, or I think it was Bishop, he talked about how the child would say, okay, I want to get an A on my test, but they ain't studied. They'd be like, Father, help me this test. I'm getting ready to take this test. But they did no homework the night before. That would be the same thing. Pray and share the word of God with believers. Yes, that is our responsibility to help us make su us sufficient. Thank you, Sister Rhonda. But Paul, the writer goes on to say how that we're under a new, we must focus. We are under a new covenant. We're no longer under the old covenant. We're not bashing it. We're just saying that the old covenant, which is the law, it had its place. Believers know that it had its place. It brought us to 
Jesus Christ. It taught us to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came, then the law was done away with. Now the law is written on our hearts. We don't have to do those sacrifices. Does it make us exempt from sin? No, it doesn't. Believer, we are to live a life according to holiness. We are to live a life that pleasing unto God, but we no longer walk under the law and carry those things over us. He goes on to say the term the New Testament refers to the new covenant so that you'll get used to those words to our new believers who are listening. Sometimes you'll hear it and you'll be like, oh, what does it mean? New Testament, new covenant. That's what it, we're not abolishing the law, but we're saying that the law ushered us into the new covenant, which is Jesus Christ. Um, Paul goes, the writer goes on to say that it is now that the new covenant is giving us life. When you had the law, it was tr also, Sister Anna, trust and have faith in his word. Amen. Thank you. The writer goes on to say that this was through no fault of the law. The benefit of following the letter of the law was learning God's way, but it wasn't earning you salvation. It had nothing. You couldn't earn salvation through keeping of the law. The writer goes on to say that he writes a story about Patrick Henry, and I love this because they tie a little bit of our history on so that we can know where our forefathers or our writers came from. And the orator, the great orator Patrick Henry, he was quoted by those words of give me liberty or give me death. He wasn't trying to play half and somewhere in between. There are only two options when it comes to one standing before God. He goes on to say on the 30, uh, 350, uh, page 355, he says that a little ways down toward the bottom, there are only two options when it comes to one standing before God. Death from the letter of the law or life in the spirit of God through Jesus. Either you want to live by the law or you want to live by life in Jesus Christ. Beloved, I told you earlier, I'm going for Jesus Christ. I'm not going for the letter of the law. There are certain things that we have to be very careful of. So the writer, Patrick Henry, he goes on to explain that Henry had decided that there were only two ways his life could proceed. It was either death or liberty. He would either die than to live under the British law anymore. Paul's view was the same. From a spiritual rather than an earthly perspective, make no mistake about it. There is no alternatives, no third or fourth choice, believer. How do you keep yourself from slipping into a half and half fiction in this regard? Paul is goes on in the word of God that he shares within the seventh through the eighth verse. Now I'm going to cover the next three sections kind of quickly. I'm not going to go delve into it. Some things I highlighted, but I wanted to share with you. The way the writer breaks this down is the first if then arguments. That's the best way I can describe it. Or if then arguments. In other words, he breaks it down like this. He says the type of logic that he uses here, that if the law was here, we would build upon the law into the next level. The law said this, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law presented what the law did, but grace and truth. So he was saying here, it was using the argument and I have it uh, highlighted. In other words, this kind of argument takes the form of, if such and such is true, then so and so, must be true also. In other words, if the law taught about getting your sins erased or you um, often the word, let me go back again, I'm sorry. I'm gonna read it to you again. The type of logic that they use, in other words, is this kind of argument that takes the form, if such and such is true, then so and so must be true also. So if one plus one equals two, and we learned about addition, we learned how you add something to another something, then one and one, one plus one equals two. If you put that plus sign between something, then it brings it together. So that means two plus two would equal four. Three plus three would equal six. So they're building up if you can get it. 
Let me know if you get it. If you have some trouble, I will explain it again. So what Paul was trying to say, and he often walked a tightrope when he talked about the old law. He had to be real careful because he was still living in the day where the Jewish people were still um, holding fast to the law. So he was not trying to say that the old law was ineffective. He was just saying that when Jesus Christ came, he built upon that. He took us higher. That grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The point of this contrast, he, the writer goes on to say, is that the radiance of Moses' face, like the covenant that had been received, it was temporary. All he was trying to say is that the law was temporary. It only lasted for a moment. It faded away. But the new covenant, believer, it doesn't fade away. If the Old Testament was temporary, then now, believer, we have something that is uh, that won't fade away. The writer goes on to explain about the faded glory, and he talked about how he don't wear jeans. I, I didn't even really get into that. I'm like, okay, jeans are jeans, but hey, whatever your choice. But he goes, what I like what he said. He said, I embrace the inheritance of the crown that will never fade away. He went on to say, he said, this means I must reject any substitute, anything that people are trying to share with you when they're coming up to you and they're trying to pull us away. Believe it, there are people who are coming up against you and coming up your, against your faith and they're trying to challenge you. But you must understand that, no, there is no other substitute. That now Jesus Christ is the new covenant. He is the reason why we have hope. The bottom line, if I don't get to it, because time is swiftly gone away, when we get to the end of it, he's talking about how hope is built upon Jesus Christ. It is based upon him. And that's where I'll, there's no other substitute. So within the ninth through the 10th verse, he goes on to do the what if argument again. And this time he talks about, he uses the scripture as a parallel. He begins to parallel in the bottom of it around the uh, last of the chapter. It says, therefore, the new covenant is superior because those who merit salvation for sin receive instead are imputed righteousness through Christ. So he's talking about how years ago the merit of condemnation was for sin. But when grace and truth came, God, Christ imputed his righteousness unto us. He poured it into us based upon not our works, but upon the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the final what if argument that he presents is in Paul's scripture, if for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remain is glorious. In other words, if you saw what the law brought to the table, and if you saw how Moses was in the presence of God and his glory shone on his face, and that was only temporary because later on Moses took off the veil and the glory was gone. But believe what he was pointing us to was the glory that is inside of us, that is inside of the believer. Once we accept Jesus Christ as our savior, he was pointing to us that that glory will never leave. If we allow the glory of God to rest, rule, and abide in our lives, it will never leave. It won't be done away. It won't fade away, but it will last. He goes on to say, uh, in that last chapter, I have it highlighted here. It says, but its force is understood to occur that uh, we must see after the comma that much more that which remaineth if glorious. What is glorious is Jesus Christ. It is the work that is being done. Seeing that we have such a hope, we have great plainness of speech. Paul was trying to get the, the people in Corinth to understand, listen. When we talk about the glory, we should be able to present it to believers everywhere with the plainness of speech. And I know we have our, our great bishops who have the eloquence of speech and things like that. I'll know Jones and love them dearly. But believer, when we start talking about this hope, which rests inside of us, we ought to be able to present it with the glorious, with a plane of speech. 
he goes on to say, imagine how ineffective Paul would have been if he said it like this. Well, maybe, perhaps there might be a hope. No, Paul was trying to, he used all those words to say, I'm listen, I'm trying to get you to a place. I'm trying to get you to understand that there's a hope. There is something that is greater than what you used to believe. I'm trying to get you excited about this thing. You don't have to bring the doves and you don't have to bring the pigeons, but there is a glory that will rest inside of you. And what is that glory? That's all the writer was trying to get us to do. We have a hope. And we have a glory. So what does the word glory mean when you talk about this in the scripture, when we share about it? Let me share. Thank you for asking that question. And I'm coming to my close. When we talk about the glory of God, we talk about the glory of God is the invisible qualities that are the act or the attributes of God displayed in a visible or knowable way. That is actually what this whole chapter is about, the glory of God. It is the invisible qualities, the love, the kindness, the um, the sympathy, the um, empathetic. Those are the qualities of, of God, his, his loving nature, his kind nature. Those are the invisible qualities that are where? They're in us, believer. Those, they're inside of us. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our savior, those qualities and characteristics are inside of us. And how are they displayed? They're displayed through us. That's how we show the glory of God through the life that we live, through the kindness, through the nine gifts of the spirit. That's how we show the glory of God. It is no longer like the veil that um, Moses had, but Jesus Christ came and he ripped the veil. He took the veil off because he's now inside of us. And now let the glory of God be revealed. Do we have sad days? Do we have bad days? Yes, we do, believers. We have some trials. We go through temptations, like Sister Tracy said. We do have suffering, but let it be, let, let us suffer and still show the glory of God. That we have a trust, we have a hope, we have a belief in the love of God, and that God is still our hope. That's how we show the glory. I'm coming to the end. Donna, I see you saying, come on, Florine, bring it into a close. But there's so much here, Donna, so much here. But anyway, let me go on. <laughs> it says, Toward the end, it says, one of the things it says is that the lesson aims was to make a plan to push toward the transformational change personally. I talked to a friend of mine. Y'all know I always got a friend story. My friends know that I put their business out there without telling their names. But I was talking to a friend today and they had shared something with me. And they said, and I, and we, I jumped up in the middle of my office and I started shouting because even that friend had recognized that her speech had changed something that she would have done normally. And it would have came with ease and I would have done it too. But as we go from grace to grace, as we learn a little bit more here, a little there, a little, as we grow in the grace of God, Beloved, we're being transformed. We are being changed. So that is what, and the final thing, I have a question. It says, what pitfalls might a believer experience if he or she will grow in the spirit happen too quickly or too dramatically? If you grow too quickly, if you don't settle yourself and learn in the word of God and study, you might fall into some of the pitfalls. So as you're walking this thing out, get in your Bible, new believers, get in the word of God, get in your Sunday school, get where somebody can teach you so you can avoid the pitfalls like Paul was sharing so that you won't fall too quickly. What are some of the pitfalls? Not dividing, not developing a personal prayer life, not learning how to, uh, to study the word of God, not being discipled, uh, not learning how prayer can make a difference, hanging around bad influence. There are so many more that if we don't grow in the knowledge and the truth of the word of God, I'm going to end there, but of course I'm going to give you homework. Praise God. 
your homework for this week. Write down some things that you know, if you are willing to present them next week, that you know has been a transforming transformation in your life. Some things that you know that has you would have done years ago if you want to be transparent. Believe it, the world is looking for transparency. And sometimes it starts with the church. And Paul was talking about that his sufficiency comes from Christ. But why don't we be transparent? So that's your homework. If you want to share something that you know transformed your life, that made a difference. I'm going to be real honest. I'm going to put mine out there. One of the things years ago, very judgmental. Well, the Bible says this. And if it's not done like that, then you got an issue. But let me tell you something. Life will teach you. Ah, to stop judging because every time things turn around, you learn that you know you need grace. There are times I need grace and still need grace. Amen. Put away that legalistic spirit and that judgmental spirit and beating everybody with the word of God. I shared with a young lady who used to go to Christ Gospel and she was in the hospital. And I said, baby, I'm not here to quote scriptures at you. I'm just here to see what you need. And her face brightened up. And even when I prayed for her, I prayed for safe travel. I prayed that the doctors would do what they do. And never once did I quote a scripture. I had already beaten her years earlier. And I apologized for that. But I began to be transformational in my life and allow God to do a work. Amen. I hope you got something. I know it was a tough scripture and it was a lot to try to smish down and get you. But I hope you receive something out of the word of God. And thank you. And um, so be ready for your homework next week. I'm not sure what I'm teaching on Wednesday or what they're going to do next week, but we'll follow it up. I, trust me, I'll remember the homework. Amen. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, is it you, Evangelist White? All right.